continue in our series, Women of the Bible. Uh, over the last six weeks, we've looked at some different women and heard some different uh, testimonies as to their lives. But this morning, we're going to specifically look at the life of Mary Magdalene and look at her life in its transformation. Her great testimony is a life transformed and the characteristics that come from that transformation. So we're going to go through Mary's story, learn about the real Mary Magdalene, and then also look at the characteristics of that life transformation and how we can apply that in our daily lives. Transformation is a change in form, appearance, whether that's inward or outward, nature or character. So I want you to think for just a moment about your own transformation. Have you experienced a transformation in your life? And if you have experienced that transformation, can anybody else identify that transformation? Can anybody look at you and say, something's different about you? Can anyone else identify with that? Can they see a difference? My transformation became obvious to other people about 15 years ago. And that was when I physically would go from walking with my head down, um, I held it in shame, quite honestly, and I would walk with my eyes downcast, and I really struggled to make eye contact with people I met because I carried a lot of shame and guilt. And making that eye contact meant that they would see the real me, and I didn't want that. So I just walked with my eyes downcast and forward. But 15 years ago, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, he restored that honor that I was born with. He restored my honor, he redeemed me, and he poured his grace upon me. He literally, physically began transforming me. And for me, it was a very outward appearance and transformation. A few weeks ago, I was worshiping, and I had this image of God, and he was bending down, meeting a small child, and the small child had his head down, and God gently bent down, and he lifted the child by its chin, and encouraged the child to make eye contact with him. And I could tell from the image that the child had a burden, or a, or a shame, or a sorrow, that the child felt sorry for something. And God was gently lifting up that child's chin, and he was reminding him of the grace that he wants to give him. And it was just such a, a great image for me because that's how he wants us to live our life. He wants us to walk purposefully. He wants us to walk confidently. And he wants us to walk with assurance of who we are in him. He wants other people to see that he's transformed our life. We are redeemed, forgiven, and we're saved by grace children. When we share our faith with someone, the one in our area that they can't argue is your own story. It's your own transformation, isn't it? Have you ever heard someone say, well, before Christ, my life looked like this. But after I accepted Christ, my life looked like this. Nobody can argue that. Not one person can take that away from you and say that's not true because it's your story. One of the great proofs of Christianity is the reality of changed lives. Now this requires a little bit of interaction, and it's a tongue twister, but I want you to turn to your neighbor, we've put the words on the screen for you to follow if you need to. Turn to your neighbor this morning and tell them, one of the great proofs of Christianity is the reality of changed lives. Start now if you want. <laughs> so many people could see it. We heard about Mary Magdalene in our reading from John, and we heard about her presence at Jesus' resurrection. But we were formally introduced to Mary Magdalene first in Luke's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, and we've got it on the screen so you can follow along. 
After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod, Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Being delivered from her tormenting captors, Mary Magdalene's transformation must have looked amazing. It must have been such a physical difference. I'm not quite sure how it looks to be possessed with seven demons, but I can imagine it's not very pretty. And it would be radical. But could you imagine the freedom that that woman felt when she was released from that affliction? Can you imagine how grateful she must have been for her Savior, the Messiah? She knew him as the Messiah. For him to drive that out of her and to just free her from all the bondage that she was feeling. She went on to faithfully serve Christ for three years of his ministry. She was with him all the way, and she did so out of her own means. The fact that the Gospel writers referred to Mary Magdalene by name shows us that she was an important, significant follower of Christ. She was mentioned by name 14 times in the Gospel, and eight out of the 14 times she was mentioned in connection with other women. And she was always mentioned first. And because she was always mentioned first, leads us to believe that she held a place of importance, that um, she occupied that place at the front of service of godly women. In the five times she's mentioned alone, it's in connection with Jesus' death and resurrection. I started researching Mary Magdalene months ago when I first heard that this is um, who I will be speaking about. And when I first read it, I thought, I'm going to be talking about a prostitute. What do I say about that? And so I started researching and reading, and I had her completely wrong. I misjudged Mary Magdalene. Many people today still think that it was Mary Magdalene who appeared first in Luke chapter 7. Jesus was invited to dinner with the Pharisees, and the woman in that town had heard that Jesus was coming. And so she entered this house with her alabaster jar filled with precious, priceless perfume. And she fell at Jesus' feet, and with a combination of shameful, sorrowful tears and her long locks of hair, she anointed his feet. And it's a beautiful story of redemption and forgiveness, but nowhere in that holy scripture does it say that this woman's name was Mary. There was also um, a testimony of Mary anointing Jesus' feet with the jar of oil, which was actually Mary of Bethany. She was Lazarus' sister. Many people today still assume that Mary Magdalene was the same woman found in John chapter 8. And this is the story of Jesus being at the temple courts and he was prepared to teach those who were sat waiting for him. And in come the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they brought this woman in and threw her at Jesus' feet. She had just been caught in the act of adultery, and they were there with their stones, ready to condemn this woman. And we know how the story goes. Jesus said, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. And nobody condemned her. Her accusers dispersed, and Jesus didn't condemn her. And again, such an amazing testimony of God's grace, isn't it? But nowhere in the Holy Scripture, in that testimony, does it name Mary. So how did we get to the point where Mary Magdalene is the sinful woman in Luke or the adulterous woman in John's chapter? John's Gospel, excuse me. How did we get to that point? Well, going back to the 6th century, Pope Gregory the Great gave a sermon. And in his sermon, he actually declared that these three women were all the same character. He declared that it was Mary Magdalene, the repentant saint. However, in 1969, the Catholic Church actually declared that that was inaccurate, and they recounted that. I never heard that de declaration. I never knew that that was recounted. So for centuries and centuries, Mary Magdalene has been unfairly portrayed as this adulterous woman, sinful woman. She was afflicted. 
just afflicted by demons, and that's what we know that we know of Mary Magdalene according to our holy scriptures. Unfortunately, a soiled reputation can linger and has followed Mary Magdalene, and Hollywood blockbuster movies have, has portrayed her this way in art and literature. But forever faithful to her Lord, Mary Magdalene was among the last at the cross to witness Christ's death. She was there at the foot of her Lord, and she was watching him go through all of this pain and torture and, and all of this just angst when the disciples had already fled. This strong woman sat there and waited and served him until the very end. In fact, she continued to serve him because she was the first at the tomb on resurrection morning. That woman was there at daybreak. We read about 4 a.m. She was there with the spices, ready to anoint, still serving her Lord even after he had died and she thought he was gone forever. Mary Magdalene today is known as the Apostle of the Apostles. Some of you may have heard that. She was the first one to receive the Great Commission. She was the first one to be told, go and tell. And she went and she told. She obeyed. How awesome of a life did Mary Magdalene have as a testimony that she was transformed and that she became the Apostle of the Apostle, going and telling. She lived out those transformation characteristics so well. So I'm going to take us through some bullet points. I've got five characteristics of, okay, so what does a transformed life actually look like? And I'm certain there are so many more characteristics than five. But as I prayed in preparation for the service, I just simply said, God, show me what it looks like. And these are the ones that he gave me. So I'm going to share them with you this morning. So the first one, a transformed life is intentional. And that's intentional with our thoughts and with our actions. With our thoughts, we can choose not to be afraid of what others may think. We can just simply follow Jesus, not worried about what they think. Mary Magdalene did it. She followed him, not worried about what other people would think. When she saw the angels after the resurrection, she took off to go and tell the disciples, not afraid of what they would say or what they would think. <coughs> be intentional with your thoughts. Don't let self-doubt get a foothold. I don't know about any of you here, but self-doubt seems to be the one thing that catches me every single time. It is the biggest downfall to me fulfilling my work. In fact, if I don't let self-doubt get a foothold in me this morning, I wouldn't be standing here today. But we can be intentional with our thoughts. We know who we are in Christ. We can be intentional with that. We don't need the thoughts of other people to change that. We know who we are. Be intentional with our actions. There was a song called We Are One of the Spirit. It's a hymn from a long time ago. And then it was made modern in a song called They, are, they Will Know We Are Christians by Our Love. And it's a beautiful song. John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Be intentional with your actions. That's what it looks like to live a transformed life. Love one another. Be kind to one another. Another characteristic, a transformed life is serving with a grateful heart. Again, even after Jesus was crucified, Mary Magdalene continued to serve him. She was the first to see him alive because I believe she continued to serve him and she honored him. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. The love of Christ compels us. We don't serve Christ out of a guilt or out of a fear. We serve Christ because we have a grateful love. And the opportunity to serve God only adds to our reasons to praise him. Charles Spurgeon observed, they are sure to praise God best who serve him best. And God doesn't want his service to be burdensome or troublesome. He wants us to do so with a thankful heart. If we're truly worshiping with thankfulness, then we'll serve with gladness. Jesus came to serve. So when we serve, we are serving our God. We are serving Jesus. A 
transformed life is being sacrificial with your time, talents and resources. Mary Magdalene willingly gave up her substance when she followed Jesus in his ministry. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Luke 21, 1-4 says, Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. A transformed life is being sacrificial with our time, talents, and resources. A transformed life is using your <coughs> spiritual gifts. The church by nature is missional. And in order for the church to maximize its mission, we all have to be working together as one, don't we? And that doesn't even mean we at Christ Church. It means we as a church, as a whole, it means working together with everyone, the body of believers, using the spiritual gifts that we've been given, learning what they are and using them. This in turn leads to a necessary emphasis on discovering what they are. The gifts are given to each of us by Christ, chosen and allotted by the Holy Spirit, and they're activated by God. Our spiritual gifts help the church in its mission, and there's loads of ways that we can use them. Christ Church has an amazing pastoral team, and they use their gifts of mercy to reach those at their time of need. I've been here many mornings when Phil's gotten up with a, with a word for someone. He has a, a gift of prophecy that he's obedient to. And that at times, I'm sure, it's quite uncomfortable for him to stand up here and go, really, you really want me to say that? It can't always be easy, but he's obedient. And every time something like that is delivered, we come together that little bit more, and the church is achieving its mission. So talk to someone who knows about spiritual gifts. Go and attend a discipleship course. But find out what your spiritual gifts are, because you have a spiritual gift. Find out what they are. Them. They're so exciting once you start understanding them. Finally, the last characteristic, characteristic I'll share is a transformed life is persistence. Persistence with your walk with Jesus. Throughout Mary Magdalene's walk with Jesus, she was there beside him. She was there at his persecution, at his trial, at Pontius Pilate when he was presenting him to the crowd. She was there at the crucifixion. She was always there being persistent. It's important that other people see that persistence in us. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him enjoyed the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, you have a transformed life. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but you have one. Because at that moment, when you accepted Christ and you made that decision to turn from your sins and to repent, your life began transforming. On a number of occasions, Howard has said to me, I don't feel any different. But on a number of occasions, his dad, who we don't know as a believer, says to me, Tina, something's changed with my son. He's different. And to me, that is such a testimony of transformation. When someone can say, you look a bit different or you've changed. I love that because, yeah, I have changed and we should be changing. We should never stay the same. We should be changing. Transformations aren't easy and they're not really pretty most of the time. I think about the butterfly in its life cycle. A caterpillar has to shed its skin four times 
before it gets to the next stage, up to four times that it grows. Maya Angelou is one of my favorite writers and she said, we delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. Change is tough, transformation is hard, but it's necessary. And it's a testimony we want other people to see why we are changing. Maybe you're here this morning and you haven't experienced a transformation in your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you are still kind of feeling your way about this whole faith thing, and that's okay. We were all there at one point or another. But if you are here this morning, we have got some amazing news for you. You don't have to stay in that state. You can close your eyes with us. You can pray with us right now to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you can watch and feel how your life will begin to transform. And I know that I know that I know that your life will transform. Zach, will you come up and just play for us while we pray, please? I'd like to pray for us. And I'd like to ask you, if you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart, that you do so this morning if you feel that is right for you. But we want to give you the opportunity because it's great to hear that you can live a transformed life. But there may be one person here this morning going, okay, that's nice, but how do I actually practically do that? And so we want to offer you that opportunity this morning. So if everyone will please bow your heads and we'll keep our heads bowed. And if you're here this morning and you want to experience a life of freedom, no longer chained up by whatever it is that's holding you down, you can release that this morning. And God can just take that straight out of your life. He can free you and begin transforming you. And it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be pretty, but you will never be on your own. Please say these words with me if you feel that that is for you this morning. God, my Father in heaven, you are holy and righteous. Thank you that you loved me. I have sinned against you. Thank you that you sent the promised Messiah, Jesus, to destroy the curse of shame and guilt. Thank you that he died in my place. I want to follow my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving and accepting me. With your head still bowed, if there's anyone here this morning who said those words, please just gently raise your hand so somebody can acknowledge it and we can pray for you before you leave because we don't want anyone here to feel like there's not an answer or a way out of the situation. Thank you. 